Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to this uh, GrassFeed 2021 side event. It's uh, level the playing field for energy efficiency investment products. Um, so we will um, have two workshops this afternoon. Um, one of them is the uh, workshop on how should researchers measure preferences for sustainability in financial markets. The first workshop will uh, have two presentations. One of them is, the, is a presentation by Rob Barra from Maastricht University on how to measure preferences for sustainability in financial markets. And that um, will take about 10 minutes, after which we'll pass to the second presentation immediately, a uh, presentation by Henk Groot, um, is the head of investments of uh, Pension Funds Detailhandel. And um, he will uh, present on how to translate investors' preferences for sustainability into an investment strategy. So um, I would propose to start uh, immediately with a presentation from uh, Rob Bauer. Um, Rob Bauer, your, it's your floor. Yes. OK, I guess everyone sees my slides. Thank you, uh, Arno, for introducing me. I have 10 minutes, so I have to be really mindful of the time. So I'm going to talk about preferences, indeed, sustainability preferences of people in financial markets. But very typically, we focus in what I talk today about on uh, the preferences of people in the pension fund context. So you and I, all of us are somehow saving for pensions. Uh, this uh, project is actually, uh, um, as you can see, sponsored by the European Commission in this level EI context. Maybe Arno can say a bit more about that at some point. Um, Wait, something is not right. Yeah, so uh, the title of my talk today is Eliciting Pension Beneficiary Sustainability Preferences. Why actually and how? And uh, you see below a little graph here, this graph with uh, the, the Dutch word mandje, which means basket. Um, this is actually a graph that one of the Dutch pension funds, in this case, Philips Pension Funds, showed to all of their participants. And they ask them, do, in which one of those four baskets do you actually want to invest? Is it the basket on the left, mind you one, in which there are some red uh, marbles uh, that are not really sustainable, white companies that are like in the middle of it, uh, light green, already on the right track, or dark green marbles, which are uh, uh, really sustainable companies. And you see they vary from very... Uh, scattered to a bit, bit no reds anymore to a lot of uh, oops to a lot of green ones and then in in the in the right hand side you see a basket with only really sustainable companies they asked this to the participants this way and the large majority actually said let's go to basket three so that's one way of doing it uh, another way of doing it uh, we describe in this paper that I presented at Wharton exactly on this topic almost the same presentation as, as I will give in those 10 minutes today. Um, and when I talked about what the Dutch are doing so that they are measuring sustainability preferences of their participants, one of the questions out of the audience was, are you a communist? Okay, they laughed when they asked it, but they, they really were flabbergasted by the fact that the Dutch actually, the fiduciaries of a Dutch uh, pension fund, the board actually asks stuff like that to participants. And then I told them what's happening in Europe, uh, also in a European context, uh, and, and the laws that are changing in that respect, and that it might be that pension funds have to do this uh, going forward, and already private banks and wealth man management organizations will have to do this in some point. So then uh, the paper that I just showed you will, will especially does especially discuss the issue of the legal and societal context that changed. That, that is different between, for instance, the US, the UK on the one hand and the Netherlands on the other. But I will also say, uh, write a bit in that paper uh, with my co-author Paul Smees about peer pressure effects. So in the Netherlands, there's a lot of peer pressure regarding uh, sustainability and maybe Hank and I can have a little bit of a chat about that as well. So there's benchmarking going on, funds compare, boards are confronted with that. Maybe also the size of the fund matters. The preferences of board members and the beliefs they have about sustainability investing, of course, also matter. I'm actually working on a new project with Paul Smates on that topic. Maybe the composition of a board makes also a difference. So it depends on who's in that board. If this is a, let's say, a representation of stakeholders in the economy, like in the Dutch context, it's fully different from uh, financial experts, like, for instance, in the Canadian context. And then 
uh, one thing that we never hear about is beneficiaries' preferences. So the question we asked ourselves when we started the, the, the first part of the project uh, with the Thai Handel uh, was, should participants of pension plans be involved in this, in this agenda, this sustainable investment agenda? And if, if so, how can you do that in a meaningful way? What I mean by that is also that what you measure makes sense. Is it, is it really the preferences of people? And how can you uh, prevent that you are measuring social desirable answers, for instance? So I'm going to keep this really short. Um, one could say, what is then sustainable investments? And for the Americans, I had to explain that. But I, I also left it in here because I, uh, it also relates a lot to what uh, actually the fund that we study is doing. Uh, you can either exclude or divest in sustainable investments, or you integrate the information into your investment process in one way or the other. Many ways you can do that. And the third is that you have some kind of an active ownership strategy in which you engage with companies, vote on shareholder meetings, do class action lawsuits, or even walk away as a Wall Street walk. So this is sort of roughly the context of sustainable investing that I'm talking about, that we also communicate with, uh, with those participants. But in the US, that's not so straightforward. So in the Obama era, there was some positive text in the Department of Labor's ERISA statements like environmental, social and governance issues may have a direct relation to the economic value of the investment. And in these instances, uh, these are not just tiebreakers, but rather proper components of a primary analysis of the economic merits of an investment choice. So in, in other words, take sustainability into account and you make decisions because it might also be good for the economic merits of your investments. But then Trump came and essentially uh, ERISA was rewritten and uh, ERISA fiduciaries must always put first the economic interest of the plan and even further, the amendments require plan fiduciaries, the board members, to select investments and investment courses of action solely on financial considerations. So even when participants have non-financial considerations, they might still uh, select um, based on uh, uh, financial considerations only. Now, in the Netherlands, meanwhile, we have this uh, covenant in which Dutch pension funds jointly, in a sort of a soft law, agree we're going to do a lot on the topic of sustainability in our investments. There is this benchmarking going on between funds. The 50 biggest funds every year get benchmarked by an organization called VBDO. And then there's the European uh, impact of the European Financing Sustainable Growth Plan, the EU Green Deal, and all the connections with investors. So that all has an impact. And the Dutch pension funds, for that reason, uh, do a lot of sustainability preference measurements in all kinds of ways. But I, I detected their potential pitfalls. So you, you might find social desirability biased answers, selection bias, representation bias, all the biases you can have in surveys or focus groups or what, whatever measure you use. So what we tried to do in the, in the study that we did with, with Pension Funds Detail Handel, so I already give some information on the fund that Hank is going to talk about as well. It's a big fund, I keep this short. Uh, it is a defined benefit plan. It has a high quality governance of the strategic investment process. Almost everything is, is delegated to external organizations, but the strategic decisions are made inside. It's focused on public and passive investments, so not so complex as many others uh, act. But they have uh, a sustainable investment program. And in 2018, when we started working with them, they had a responsible investment program characterized by exclusion, proxy voting, and engagement under the belief, the investment belief, that the integration can be implemented without compromising key portfolio characteristics. And they, they approached us. Uh, I just give this information for your background when you look back at the, at the slides. Um, so they approach us and ask us, can you help us? And we told them, if you want to get rid of the social desirability bias, you, you really have to give people a real vote because then the vote has a consequence and then you can really uh, infer more out of that than if you just ask, do you want sustainability? Because we're all saying yes to that question, especially if a camera is directed at us. Um, so uh, in this case, of course, the survey is, is anonymous. Uh, but, but you know, if you, if you walk on the street, you, you give social desirable answers if the TV comes by and asks you about this. Uh, so what they found in the study is that close to 70% of the participants are willing to expand and intensify the fund's engagement effort based on certain selected SDGs, even when they expect these 
intensified engagement, so more engagement to hurt the financial performance. And we show in a paper, the Get Real paper that is attached to that, that is just published in the Review of Financial Studies, that strong social preferences drive this result. So in the remaining few minutes, if I have them, Arno, because I'm, I know I'm a bit uh, uh, stressed on time, I show three figures that sort of give the main results of, uh, of this. And what these figures have in, in, the, in common is that uh, one of the uh, studies was done in, 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 in 2018, around, uh, I think, the summer uh, or before the summer. And the results were published in November. And immediately after that result, the board of the fund also executed on that results because it was a real vote. The result came in and the board decided that whatever participants want, in this case, intensification of the engagement program, uh, we will execute that. But then there was also a study too, in which we show that this preference remained stable two years later in the midst of COVID. And also after the board decided to do even more than, they, than their participants asked. And that's what I'm gonna show you now. So here you see um, the, the, the two studies, study one in 2018, study two in 2020, June. And you see that engagement, when, we, when people are asked, do you want engagement to be intensified or more engagement? Then you see that people in the study one in 2018, roughly 70% said yes to it. 10% said no, 20% didn't know what to answer. In study two, that number is a bit lower. Um, probably because people don't really understand what engagement is, although in the surveys we, we try to explain that with all kinds of extra information, but it's difficult to understand what engagement is. But if you, if you show people what screening is, so overweighing companies that do well on sustainability, underweighing companies that do uh, not so well on sustainability, then you see that people have a huge support for that. But this wasn't actually the question in study one, it was only the question to intensify the engagement. Still, people really like that, and that could be uh, uh, the result, of course, uh, of, of maybe better understanding what screening is. It relates to the marbles I showed you at the beginning. So when you then look at, uh, at the results a bit more carefully, and, and, and the study of study two, we, we had a more granular uh, approach. You can see here on this uh, x-axis that we ask people, uh, if you go into this more sustainable investment uh, path, then retirement benefits will be either lower, higher, equal, or much higher or much lower, or you don't know. And what you can see here is that quite a lot of people think that it will lead to better returns, but there's also a substantial group of 25 and 5%, so 30% that says it might lead to lower returns. If you then go to the right-hand side of this panel, you see that even the people that expect that that, that will lead to lower returns, still more than 50% want to have engagement or screening to continue, sorry. So only in this really small group of roughly 5% of the people that say, uh, we think that leads to lower returns, much lower returns, they also don't, do not want to, this to be executed. But the board said, if more than 50%, which is certainly the case, likes this, we're gonna uh, do this engagement in 2018. So in 2020, they, they, they did the engagement, uh, they did the screening as well. So they decided, and I think it was, uh, Hank can tell you a bit more detail about that in 2019 to also screen next to engagement. So it is marble activity, but the sort of a very light green uh, over and under weighing versus the benchmark. And you see that the pension participants in the fund really like that. But again, this, this small part uh, here, over here, shows that in some cases with much lower uh, um, returns expected, they don't. So then we had the question, what does this mean for COVID? So of course, COVID will have an impact on retirement benefits, especially when you're in the midst of it in June 2020, you have this idea. And you can see that also here. Many people think it will lead to lower returns lower retirement benefits, that's what I have to say. And of course, quite some people don't know, like I would not have known if you would ask, ask me at that point. But despite COVID, everybody wants screening and a very small minority wants uh, uh, no engagement if there are much lower uh, retirement benefits if that is happening. So summarizing and, and, and going to, to Hank, um, the population or the sample of the population of participants of, of the Thai handle 
uh, are really into the topic of sustainability, uh, even more into screening than into engagement. The majority wants it and the board acted on it. I don't say that this is the only way to measure it and that there are no pitfalls in this way to measure it, but at least there are consequences to the choices you make here. And this is the start of something. So we will continue to interact with those participants uh, in, in the future. Maybe we can talk about that a bit later on as well. But that I, I conclude my presentation, also given the time. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I think I will pass it on straight to Henk um, on the how to translate investors' preferences for sustainability into an investment strategy. Henk, the floor is the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mira. Thank you, Rob. And I think you already told a. Uh, uh, a lot of what we did, uh, but I want to make it a little bit more focused on, on what we did as a pension fund to integrate ESG uh, and to integrate the outcomes of, uh, of the study or the two studies you did for us in our um, investment uh, policy and uh, portfolio. Uh, but first, I want to um, well, give you an overview of, of some figures. Um, pension fund detail uh, if you re if you translate that it's the pension fund for the retailers in the Netherlands uh, with quite a lot of active participants but with even uh, more uh, former participants or not active participants um, we have around 120 pensioners uh, 32,000 employers and uh, 32 billion of assets and I think Rob already mentioned that uh, if you look at our uh, investment policy and our portfolio, it's quite simple. 30% uh, is, is equity, uh, passively managed, which is um, a part developed equity and part uh, emerged market equity. Then we have a 60% fixed income, also passively managed and LDI portfolio, which is of course not passively managed, but the fixed income portfolio is uh, consisting of uh, Euro government bonds, um, a credit portfolio, a high yield and emerging market debt. And then we have a 5% uh, exposure to listed, 2.5% listed and 2.5% Dutch private uh, real estate uh, and 4.5% Dutch mortgages. So that's, um, that's an overview. Uh, and if you, again, if you look at our liquid portfolio, it's, um, it's for 90% of the total uh, passively managed. Um, when we started the cooperation with uh, the Utrecht uh, University uh, and they executed the first, um, first uh, survey, um, indeed, as Rob said, uh, we said, okay, uh, we're gonna ask our participants uh, how they look at our current ESG policy, uh, but also we want to know what they think of it and if we are ambitious enough, if we were to ask them. Uh, and if we then ask that question, uh, what are we going to do with the, with the outcome? Um, if the outcome is, um, is that they want us to be more ambitious uh, and adding, for example, another SDG, uh, what will we do? And the board indeed committed to um, give, ask that question to the participants. Uh, and if the uh, answer in majority was that they want us to add another SDG, so um, well, basically saying you're not ambitious enough, then we will commit ourselves to add a fourth uh, SDG to our, uh, to our policy. And that's what we did. Uh, and why did we do that? Uh, because as a board, the, the board of, of our fund said, well, uh, when we started our ESG policy uh, development, uh, we are now thinking for our participants. So we are making up a storyline, which is the supply chain in, in the trade, uh, um, well, the, the trade supply chain. Uh, and we chose some uh, ESG themes, um, but basically we are thinking for our participants, uh, but we want to involve them. And that's what we did in the survey. And again, if they think that our story is not, storyline is not correct or is not ambitious enough, then we have to listen to them and give it a place within our uh, policy, but also within our portfolio. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, what we did um, in our uh, SRI policy after the survey, because what, what we also said is, okay, now we have done a lot of talking, we have done a lot of uh, surveying, and now it's, um, it's time to, to act. Um, 
So we wrote quite an ambitious um, uh, ESG policy. Um, ambitious, uh, if you look at the policy uh, we had before uh, 2020. Uh, and we also said, well, we, um, we're going to uh, make KPIs very um, uh, explicit. And the most important KPIs in our 2020-2022 in, uh, SRI policy are integrate the four SDGs that we uh, focus on in all of our passive uh, liquid portfolios. Um, at that time, we were just following basic um, uh, uh, benchmark like the MSCI World, uh, MSCI uh, uh, Emerging Market Benchmark, for example. Uh, and we said, well, how are we going to integrate that, uh, the SDGs in our portfolio? And if you look at how we are organized, we always say we want to separate powers. So the policy making is done by the board. Uh, the management is done by, um, well, the best in class uh, providers in the market. And then we also have an independent uh, monitoring and control uh, uh, part of the organization. Uh, and if you then um, integrate SDGs in a passive portfolio and you ask your manager to do that, so to do the screening and uh, align your portfolio in that way, that is a little bit, um, um, well, in contrast uh, with how we look at uh, a separation of power. So we thought um, it's better to, to ask index providers to, uh, to see if they can screen as well and if they can screen on SDGs then we can just construct our own benchmarks give the benchmark uh, the custom benchmark to our uh, managers and they only need to execute uh, based on that uh, that benchmark uh, we found um, we organized a partnership with Fuji Russell and we started with the developed equity per, uh, benchmark which uh, formerly was an MSCI benchmark uh, and we um, uh, rebuilt it to a custom SDG aligned benchmark uh, for our uh, pension fund. So that was um, quite an important uh, change in, uh, in how our portfolio looked like. Um, we moved on with, with the uh, emerging market equity portfolio. Um, and now we are currently uh, in, the, in the final stage of also doing the same um, trick, I would say, uh, within our credit portfolio. And well, we will mo move on to the emerging, mar emerging market um, uh, debt portfolio and high yield portfolio further on in 2021 and 2022. Also, we said, well, given that our participants want us to be more ambitious, uh, we have to carefully look at green bonds. Um, so we set a KPI to 5% of the total fixed income portfolio. Um, and also we said we are with green bonds, there is a sort of an indirect impact that you, that you make. Uh, but we also want to make a direct impact in our investments. So we are currently in the final stage of selecting um, uh, impact funds that are aligned with our SDGs, the four SDGs that are in our uh, investment policy or ESG policy, I must say. Uh, furthermore, of course, uh, very topical is ESG risks. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, the new report came out, of course, a couple of weeks ago. So that's something that also our uh, supervisor is, uh, is very um, uh, focused on. Uh, and, but we were already, before they uh, asked us to do that, we were already uh, looking at ways to do that. Um, on the one hand, top down. Uh, on, on the other hand, um, uh, bottom up. So that's something that we are currently in the midst of. Um, another KPI is the align the engagement um, um, uh, program, more with our, uh, our focus SDGs. Um, and one very big ambition is to work or collaborate even more uh, with other institutional investors. And that's something that's um, easily said, but uh, very difficult um, to do. But we managed in the Dutch market to, to launch the Dutch engagement network. We worked together with, uh, with another uh, large uh, pension fund um, and we um, uh, cooperate in engaging um, with, with companies there. So that's, that's a good start. Um, next slide, please. If you look at integrating uh, the four SDGs in our liquid portfolios, a very high level overview of what we did. Um, when we started our ESG policy, 
uh, we were focusing on um, labor rights, human rights, uh, climate, of course, and also um, company ethics. Uh, but then the SDGs were not uh, on the table yet. So um, a few months later, uh, the SDG, SDGs were um, made public and then we uh, aligned the SDGs with those four themes. So with labor rights, human rights, climate and environment and with uh, company ethics. And that's what, basically what we, what we did with Fuji Russell. Uh, so underlying sub um, uh, sub uh, SDGs are um, um, also aligned to uh, to uh, the screening process, um, and indeed Rob already mentioned it. It's quite a simple, of course it's complicated, but quite uh, simple to explain what we are doing, and that's just overweighting and underweighting. It's a sector ne sector neutral approach. Uh, and um, on top of uh, integrating SDGs in the portfolios, of course, we have our regular exclusion, uh, engagement and proxy voting uh, instruments that, uh, that we use. Um, and I think that um, this is basically maybe to the last slide. I can give an overview of what we are currently doing. I already explained, uh, we did the uh, integration of SDGs in passive developed market equity portfolio and also in the emerging market equity portfolio. Um, we are trying to, uh, to do the same uh, by the end of this year in our credit portfolio. Um, and in the next coming months and in 2022, we will do emerging markets uh, and high yields, emerging market debt and high yields. And we are still puzzled how to do this in our Euro government portfolio. So uh, we are still um, uh, trying uh, and speaking to a lot of uh, other pension funds, but also uh, market uh, participants, how we can integrate SDGs in, in a Euro government portfolio, which only consists of six Euro countries. Uh, this, that's quite a difficult one. So if, um, if there are participants that have uh, any uh, interesting ideas about how to do that, uh, I'm open to receive uh, comments or, or information about that. That was it. Thank you very much, Henk. Uh, I propose that before we, walk, uh, we move on to workshop two on how to measure investors' impact, that um, you maybe discuss uh, a little bit further between the two of you. And in the meantime, I invite everybody uh, to who has any questions, who have any comments, to post them, uh, and uh, we will put them to, to the speakers. Thank you. Yes, let me kick off, um, Hank. Of course, we speak each other a lot, and uh, when you, because we work together, we are even setting up a, a different program on uh, measuring risk preferences of participants. And I, I think that's also quite interesting. So the Dutch regulator for pension funds wants uh, pension funds to be able to measure the risk preferences of their participants. But then at the same time, we also measure sustainability preferences. And, and what puzzles me, and I, I know you don't have the easy answer, so I just, I just want to hear what the board thinks about this. Maybe you have something to say. How they interact. I mean, it could be that, for instance, uh, people say we don't want to take a lot of risk in financial terms. Yeah, so could be on average. But at the same time, uh, they are uh, they have high sustainability preferences and they don't like climate risk, physical risk or whatever risk coming into the portfolio. So how are we going to deal with that? And does the regulator actually have a clue about this? It's more an open question. Well, to answer the last question, um, I think they have a clue, but it's not that they put um, anything on the table, um, guidelines on the table that you have to, uh, to have to follow. So it's your own journey that you have to, uh, that, that you have. Uh, in the meantime, of course, when we started conversations about um, doing a survey amongst participants and not just a survey or, or um, but a real academic uh, survey on, 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 um, on ESG and uh, risk preferences on that side, of course, we had discussions on the board, around the board table about, okay, but if uh, very controversial things come out of this, uh, this survey, um, how uh, does that uh, align with our responsibilities? Uh, 
Uh, can we still then um, uh, align with the, with the current risk, uh, risk return uh, um, um, profile that we have? And so there was a lot of, uh, a lot of board members were, uh, were a bit afraid that that survey, the outcomes of that survey, um, well, yeah. let them into a, a situation whereby they, uh, uh, well, had, had some problems with uh, executing their board position, but at the end, uh, I think uh, it worked out very, very good. And uh, and and what we uh, what we got back from from the participants and also employers is that they really appreciated uh, the, the way we did this, um, and and that we also the board. I said, I always say uh, we, but I mean the board uh, stick to what they uh, promised uh, in in the, in the first survey. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I'm, I'm waiting for Arno. I have had no questions so far from the floor. Um, I believe you are being very clear, I guess, about- uh, oh, I, 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 we, could, we could definitely continue. There's so many things to say about this. Um, um, the, just now- there, there are some questions coming in, you see? Correct. Yeah. I can see that questions about uh, the three, four SDGs, and uh, maybe I can answer that one. Um, again, when when we started uh, a long time ago, thinking about uh, establishing our own uh, ESG policy, um, we thought, okay, what would be our storyline? Um, looking at what kind of pension fund we are, we are the pension fund for the retailers. So, what would be our storyline? Uh, and that storyline. Um, was um, again the, the 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 supply chain in the retail and and wholesale uh, uh, sector, uh, and and then we said, okay, if that's our storyline, which uh, which themes are um, strongly aligned with those uh, with that storyline, and then we came up with human rights, uh, um, labor rights, and then company ethics or governance, of course. Uh, but also, and that's not really aligned with, uh, of clearly aligned to 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 that storyline. But of course, climate and environment was very important. So, when we had those four themes on the table, uh, a few months ago, uh, a few months later, the SDGs uh, came came out, because at that time there were no SDGs yet. And then we said, okay, and if we then look at the seventeen SDGs and we align those with with the themes that we uh, that we came up with. Um, which are the strongest, the, which ones are uh, the strongest aligned with, with those. Uh, and then we came up with three SDGs, eight, uh, 13 and 16. Uh, but we were very much doubting about um, um, SDG 12 at that time. And then we said, okay, if we are going to do a survey, um, let's, uh, let's just ask our uh, participants. Um, so we think that uh, 12 is strongly aligned, of course, with, with, uh, with the supply chain. Um, we want to add it, but let's ask our participants. And that's how the fourth SDG uh, came in our EUC policy. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I think if I can add to that. Um, so if you, I, I already very briefly talked about the soft law going on in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, and this covenant that the 50 Dutch pension funds or so, or maybe even more signed, one of the things they, they, these funds pledged is that they would interact with their stakeholders, in this case, beneficiaries, um, uh, how, how they decide on their investment policy. So I think uh, the tie handle was a front runner and a lot of funds are doing it, but still have some issues with it. But it's especially interesting because the European Union is also forcing private banking organizations and wealth organizations to ask their clients to show their preferences, not just on risk, but also on sustainability. And then it's very important that you measure that properly. Uh, because if you could steer it, I, as a bank, I can ask you in a survey quite easily something in such a way that the result will be dark green investments. That's what, what I need. And if that's the case, you deliver them these dark green, high cost private equity investments uh, or, or whatever impact investments. And then the question is, is that really in the interest of, uh, of the people that, that invest? 
as because it's high cost and maybe the net return are not that well. So I think it's it's really important that we that we are able to measure these preferences properly. And I don't say that this is the only way you can do it. I mean, uh, there are tons of other uh, uh, ways to measure preferences that are used in the literature. And I think we should definitely do that. And especially if you measure something in the field when people make actual decisions. And so you, you go to a bank and you make a decision and that you then observe what is happening. That is probably a way forward. Uh, that's some of the things that we as a university are working on to, to start new field experiments to measure these things. Thank you very much. Uh, there's one more question. It's, um, I'll read it out. It's, were some voting resolutions and or engagement activities on these topics successful in terms that companies changed their behavior? I don't know who would like to take this question. Well, maybe um, um, a general answer to it. Um, what we as a company, as, as a pension fund do is when, that we work together with a provider that um, is um, uh, executing our, uh, our engagement uh, policy. And in that way, we already collaborate with a lot of other institutional investors because that company does have a lot of other uh, institutional clients that are doing the same. Um, and of course, at the beginning of the year, we all or always, not only us, but also the other clients of that uh, provider uh, are doing an assessment. What's the, what's the most important theme this year? Uh, where do we need to uh, focus on? Um, and that results in a priority list of, uh, of, of themes and uh, subjects that um, they are going um, to address on the, on, on, on the board's table of, of, of uh, listed companies. And of course, we are also monitoring if um, the things that we ask and engage on, if that um, has a good result. Um, and we currently in, in the midst of a discussion with our own board, um, when and how um, we should um, decide on excluding companies uh, after which period and after which signal uh, that we send out. So it's, it's um, not that I can say um, that, uh, well, well, I can say that engagement uh, programs do have a lot of influence on the company's behavior. Um, and we get, uh, uh, well, the reports we, uh, we receive uh, show that. In the meantime, we are still having our uh, pension fund still uh, needs to, uh, to make the, the next step uh, by deciding when to exclude companies if they don't listen to our story, uh, popular uh, uh, said. Yeah, and there's also this cascade that, uh, so if you use an engagement agent that is part of a coalition like the Climate Action 100 plus, how can you measure what contributes to what? I think that's also not the real purpose to know that. It's more that you really change companies and it's very difficult to, 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 to actually say this is what led to this or did not lead to this. Um, but you know, you, 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 you can see a lot of examples in the recent uh, few months of engagement in oil companies having an impact in all kinds of ways. So I think, uh, including lawsuits. So, well, let's hope that that continues that way. Yeah. I think we still have time for one last quick question. We have one minute. Um, so do you think that sustainability preferences are one dimensional, like risk? I kind of see several dimensions, values, ESG risks, and impact. Yeah. Shall I start, Hank? I think so, yeah. I think it's, it, this is, of course, a very uh, good question in the sense that how do you measure preferences and how can you disentangle preferences from beliefs? And, uh, and, and how, um, I mean, you can have preferences uh, and beliefs that are overlapping or not. So if you like ESG, but the returns are low, suppose you have low beliefs or returns, it's a very tough decision for you yourself to make. But of course, if you like ESG and you expect high returns, then of course, it's an easy one. And then there's the impact question that you are going to talk about, uh, Julian. So uh, yes, there's a lot more to investigate there. Uh, and I, I think another question, another dimension to this is, will this stay stable or does it also change individually or as a society? So I think uh, probably not. Uh, although psychology shows that in a lot of cases, certain preferences are stable. 
But the question is, if we update our knowledge about what's happening to the planets and the planetary boundaries that we that we face, then maybe we also change preferences. I don't know. So it's a tough question to answer in one minute. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, to both of you, Rob and Hank. Um, I think it's time now to move on to workshop number two uh, on how to measure investors' impact. Um, there will also be two presentations. There will be a presentation um, by Dr. Julian Goldberg uh, from the University of Zurich uh, on the Investor's Guide to Impact. And that will be followed by an other presentation um, by Two Degrees Investing on best practices regarding financial impact products. Um, that will be presented by Mikhail Mongo. Um, the floor is yours, um, Julian. Hello? Can we hear you? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. We'll just take one thing. I'm sorry about that. So uh, now I, I think you can see me. I can see you and I can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, sorry about that hiccup, but uh, hello everyone. And thank you Arnaud for having me on this, on this great panel. Uh, I'm Julian Kalbel. I'm a postdoc at the University of Zurich. And uh, since some time at this Center for Sustainable Finance and Private Wealth that we have here, we've been thinking about the impact of sustainable investing. And um, this is a question that actually, I think these days is, is becoming more and more center stage as the, the industry and this whole idea of sustainable investing, at least in Europe, but also in the US has become almost mainstream. Uh, a lot of funds are flowing into this. And of course, there's always this hope that this is going to help in, uh, in a massive way, given the massive assets involved, to address the topic of climate change and, and get a, get, make progress in other important sustainability areas. And I want to say, basically, I'm going to give a presentation uh, based on a paper where we simply reviewed the evidence that there is today for various mechanisms that investors can use there. So uh, let me share this. Um, Okay, just a brief check. Is it is it visible? Um, I on my side don't see uh, don't see your presentation. Uh, we, we we did check it, didn't we? Let me try again. It says you're, you are sharing your screen, but I do not see the presentation, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I'll try one more time, and then if it doesn't work, maybe one of the uh, one of the technical supporters we have on the call, maybe they can share the presentation. Is it still? Yes, it's still a dark screen. Um, we would dark need some. I, I have one idea what could be the issue because I put this on full screen and then sometimes it is. Okay. I think, I think now it will work. I think I know what happened. So now I think you see it. Yes, it yes we see it. And then okay, let me put it full screen again and I hope it doesn't disappear. Is it it's still there? Perfect. Yes, it's okay. there. Super. Okay. So uh, the, yeah, this is, I, I gave my introduction, how to change the world as an investor. This is, this is the idea. So, uh, and this here you get the, <laughs> who asked this question just now. I think personally, it's quite um, different to, to keep different motivations a little bit apart that are behind the sustainable investing. And I mainly see these three of values, impact and performance. So values are, I think, quite important. There's a sense of, I don't want to profit from coal mining, just as an example. Uh, some people say that, 
um, simply not being associated with that. Then there's a performance angle. So some people will say, well, considering climate risks will yield actually better returns. And, and that can be a motivation to invest sustainably. And then there's a third one, and this is this impact angle. I really actually want to help fight climate change. And this presentation, I just want to say, I think all of these are present. And, and what we're talking about is purely this orange point, right? We, we look at it from that angle. And, and why does this matter? So um, there is, you know, the SDGs very prominent as well. And uh, the UN um, has communicated that there's this funding gap. So basically they say you need two and a half trillion US dollars per year um, in order to finance um, uh, these SDGs. And then if you look at the inflows currently into sustainable investing, very broadly speaking, admittedly, but sort of there's more inflows per year than this supposed funding gap. And then obviously you wonder if so much money is coming in, uh, you know, shouldn't we be pretty close to uh, solving these um, SDGs? And I think that's where the question of impact comes in. How much does each dollar in that bucket actually cause in the real world? Um, everything that I'm saying is based on this paper that you can read. It's an academic paper. We also uh, packaged it into some sort of practitioner focused guide. Uh, it's a bit easier to read uh, and, and a bit more to, um, to the point for people in, in the practice. Um, and the, the key concept I think is about what is impact in the first place. Um, it's a word that's being used a lot right now. Um, our view is this is something that changes in the real world and it's, it's caused by your activity. So basically you can imagine some, some, some number, some parameter is, is, is evolving. So if we have here as an example, the number of people with access to drinking water so, you know, people build houses and so on that fluctuates. And then you do something uh, that could be anything, really. Maybe you, uh, yeah, you make an investment, for example. And then afterwards, it progresses in a different way. Uh, and if you didn't do that, it, it would have stayed uh, on, the, on, the, on the bottom, right? So, so this is really the idea of impact. And, and the problem, of course, is that you, you never see what would have happened if you didn't do it. Right, so that's why it's so tricky to actually measure impact. Um, and I think the best we can hope for at the moment is sort of to um, carefully guess impact looking forward and make a good decision on, on what we do, where our impact will be greatest. Measuring, I think, is, is really difficult. You basically need to run experiments in the field. And the key concept too is that sort of exposure to impact is not equal to having an impact. So we pre present this framework of investor impact and company impact. The company impact is easier to understand. This is, you have a company, it um, has smokestacks, smoke is coming out. So there is some impact of the company on the world. So carbon emissions are caused and, and this is an impact on the climate. So the company has that impact. Now, you as an investor, you look at the change that you induce in the company. Um, so simply being invested in, in green or brown companies, that's not yet your investor impact. Basically, what you want to look at, how does the company change because of your investment, right? And it's the same idea here, what would have happened if you didn't invest or whatever the activity was. Okay, so just to illustrate that Vestas, I think is a great example of, of a pretty green company. Uh, they produce these windmills. Yes, I know some people have issues with, with windmills, but um, if you purely limit it to sort of power generation uh, technology, it, it's a pretty clean way of producing energy. They are a pioneer in building this plant. So you could argue that the company impact, sort of the company Vestas has a positive impact on the climate. Now, the, the question is, does buying Vestas shares also have a positive impact on Vestas, right? Um, so clearly the company doesn't disappear if you sell these shares or it doesn't spring into existence if you buy them, you buy them from other people, then there's questions what happens with the price and does that at the end of the day really help Vestas to potentially sell more of these windmills? 
um, this is it's kind of the, the thing you have to, the, the, the challenge you're confronted with in determining what is your impact as an investor. You have to think about this investor impact. Um, and, and that also entails that sort of exposure to, like as I said, right? You can actually have impact by investing in brown companies potentially. Um, so if you think on the left-hand side here about a green company that has some imaginary company impact of 100, hundred and it has that before and after your investment so it didn't grow it also didn't do anything differently um, due to your investment then basically your investor impact is, is zero unfortunately because nothing has changed in the world right so just an example to clarify this and in contrast there could be a brown company that has a negative impact of minus 100 and you come in and as an investor, potentially you will have a good engagement team and you convince this company, uh, let's say they, they produce steel and you produce, you convince them to sort of invest and, and half the emissions that they have producing that steel, right? So in that case, your investment actually had a positive investor impact of 50, even though the company might still be considered a relatively dirty company. Um, I think that's, that's an important concept in this area of how do we think about impact and then let's let's get to the mechanism so it's basically you can grow green companies or you can improve brown companies so so in that little diagram you can you can think of companies have a certain size they can be small or large and they can be brown or green and as an investor you can come and do one of two things you can sort of find a small green company and help it grow, right? And then that positive impact of the small green company, which is small, because the company is small, is growing. And to the extent that you support that growth, uh, you as an investor, um, you know, you, you really brought something to the table and you helped. Um, so this works with companies that have a positive impact in the first place. And an important and a bit tricky condition is that their, their growth should be limited by external financing conditions. So companies who can already realize all the growth options that they have, it's, a, it's tough to help them. But sort of small and young companies who are still raising capital and sometimes have difficulties doing that, companies operating in immature financial markets where it's not easy to tap into capital and companies with intangible assets that sort of, um, you know, for that reason have difficulty um, reassuring investors, there your chances are larger to have the sort of this growing green companies impact. The other basic mechanism is, is improving brown companies. So um, here you can do this with small and or large companies, right? It's sort of the other axis in this diagram um, a company, as I mentioned before, a steel company who is not using state-of-the-art equipment uh, has potentially large, uh, large opportunities to reduce their negative impacts. Um, and by, by pressing for that as an investor, you, you can then uh, have a significant impact by transitioning the company itself, basically. So, Voting and engagement is sort of the, the standard and, and most straightforward way of going about that. Um, it's important that the companies have room to improve. Um, and also, I think it's important to say that this is somehow restricted to incremental change. So I think sort of turning around a company in this way is, um, is a stretch, but there are still lots of worthwhile low hanging fruit, I think still to be harvested around the world um, in all sorts of industries and all sorts of topics. Okay, so just to give an example, this is sort of an extreme example for the growing the green company. So root capital, this is one of these uh, sort of specialized asset managers. They found a coffee cooperative in, in Rwanda and they had good coffee, uh, but they were selling the coffee raw locally. And 
they could catch a much higher price if they were selling their coffee to um, specialty coffee markets directly uh, overseas. Uh, and that would be actually a, a great business proposition for them. And it's also a good idea for an investor to come in. The thing is, they didn't find an investor to finance you know, some working capital. Um, they need to roast the coffee on site. And, and that was basically what was holding them back from realizing that growth opportunity that, that made business sense. So here, root capital coming in, financing that pretty clear case of investor impact. Uh, they make more money, the investor gets something. Obviously, this is going to be a small ticket. And obviously, there are political risks probably involved. Uh, you have to do a ton of due diligence on things like that. So you make trade-offs, but this is an example how you have impact. Another extreme example is, is Hermes. Like this is now, you know, transitioning from brown to green. So Sinopec is a Chinese oil company. Uh, they had quite a bit of methane leakage uh, as part of their oil production. Methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. Um, and Hermes, one of the providers of engagement services, they initiated a dialogue and basically brought this up that this was a good opportunity to massively reduce their own carbon footprint. And as a result of that, they launched a methane reduction program that in total saved 440 million tons of CO2. This is actually quite a lot. This is like a, a small country. Um, but of course, at the end of the day, it's, it's still an oil company, right? So this is what I want to highlight also with incremental change. So they, they produce the same stuff, the oil is still being burned, but the actual extraction is happening now in a more sustainable way. This is another good example how to have impact. Now, sorry, Julian, for interrupting. Uh, could I just ask you to slowly start wrapping up because it's, uh, well, tight on time. Yeah, it's, it's perfect timing, actually. I just want to sort of show this slide because the, the session is called Measuring Investor Impact. I think we're still quite a bit from there. In this table, we sort of took the different approaches in sustainable investing and said, okay, what is the level of evidence and what are probably important criteria that you have to look at in order to make this work? I'm not going to go into the details, but if you're interested, this is in our guide, and I'm always happy to talk about this in, in more depth. The key takeaways are basically, you know, if you want to have impact, and that's an if, uh, you know, you should allocate capital to young, impactful companies. You should improvement, encourage improvement across your portfolio, and you can do that with voting and engagement or with very clear screening criteria. And finally, I think there's a case for supporting systemic change as an investor, um, which, which can be important as well, um, because investors do have an important political voice. So with that, I want to wrap up. Thanks a lot. And um, yeah, that's, that's it. And I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. I will now pass on to the presentation from uh, Michael Monroe of uh, 2D investing um, on best practices regarding financial markets. Thank you, Arno. Uh, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, I hear you perfectly. Yes, perfect. Uh, so uh, my talk would be right a continuation of what, just, what Julian just said, especially the very last slide he, he uh, provided, the one on impact mechanisms. So uh, at 2DI, uh, I'm the head of retail investing at 2DI. And in that research program, we are interested into understanding the, the preferences of retail investors regarding sustainability. So, and like uh, Julian said, uh, there can be, very, and, and Rob and Hank as well, there, there, there can be many different types of uh, sustainability preferences. So we have to figure out uh, what are the most important ones for people, what are the different subgroups, et cetera. But we are also interested into knowing what the industry is providing uh, in face of those uh, demands by the retail investors. So we are interested in understanding better the different green financial products that are currently proposed. And the financial industry is very frantic in proposing new products that are supposed to be green or labeled green and that are, that are supposed to support the green energy transition. 
So uh, we are uh, observing whether they can have an impact because we know that at least some people within the retail uh, investing uh, community definitely want to have impact. We have data at 2DI and there are other studies showing that retail investors, at least some of them, want to have impact. So we need a grid to understand what's the actual level of impact provided by the so-called green financial products. So I'm gonna present uh, a work that is currently ongoing uh, at 2DI about understanding the impact of green financial products. And I will try to do it uh, in less than 20 minutes. So here is it. Could you just confirm you can see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Yes, so uh, I will put it in full screen. And it should be better. So uh, here, uh, so uh, Julian introduced the concept of uh, company impacts and investor impacts. Here, I need to introduce another concept, which is product impacts. So uh, regarding the definition of impact, I think Julian was very clear uh, and especially the application to company and investors. So I will not go back to this, but uh, what is clear is that in every case, the question you have to ask yourself is uh, what if, what if the person you are uh, interested in did not exist? So what if the company did not exist? Would the impact on the, on the world, the society and the environment would be better or worse? And same for investor. What if the investor had never existed? Would the society be better off or worse off? And we have to distinguish between company and investor impact. Like there is an impact chain with different layers, different steps. And in between there is financial products. So I think we can apply the same way of reasoning of impact that is uh, centered on the concept of additionality at the product level. So at the product level, uh, product impact would be the change uh, to the world that is caused by the creation and the use of a certain financial product. And it has to be compared to an hypothetical counterfactual scenario when the product would not have existed or would not have been used by any company, any issuer. So in that very hypothetical counterfactual scenario, companies would have raised capital differently using other financial products or would have never raised capital. So uh, what we need to think is whether the new green financial products add new financing capabilities to companies that are used by companies or are just substitutes for existing uh, classic financial solutions like uh, stocks, bonds, loans, et cetera. And there are plenty of new uh, green financial products. So green bonds are very known, very well known. You have sustainability linked lo loans, sustainability linked bonds. You have low carbon mutual funds. You have uh, uh, thematic uh, equity funds. All of them are connected in some way or another to the financing of the green energy transition. And in the mind of people, most probably, they are supposed to actively, to positively contribute to the fight against climate change. But we need to test whether it's true. Uh, so when we think about product impact, uh, we have to differentiate it versus um, uh, uh, investor impact. Uh, this is that slide. Uh, it's pretty counterintuitive to notice that if uh, a product has an impact, it doesn't mean that if you use the product, you increase your own impact as an investor because it's all a matter of additionality. Again, uh, if a product, let's say, is oversubscribed, that there is a massive demand for uh, some uh, green products. If you invest in that product, even if we could prove that that product has translated into real life efforts by the companies to improve their uh, carbon emissions, for instance, we couldn't prove that uh, your 
so there, there is product impact, but we cannot prove that at the same time, the person that used that product is having a positive impact because it could be substituted. It could be replaced by another investor. So a product can have an impact if it helps companies to grow, as Julian said, a green companies, I mean, or if it forces brown companies to change because uh, of a certain features of the, of the product. But as an investor, if you use it, you're not sure to have an impact because it all depends on the, on the competition across investors. If there are a lot of uh, investors fighting for, for the same green products, the products could have a real impact, but not the investors using the products. So that's an important uh, feature, I think. Uh, it may be a zero-sum game between all investors. Uh, regarding product impact, uh, the product impact would definitely depend on the use of the product. If the product may have a very good impact potential, but it's used by nobody, it will have no impact. So it all depends on the deployment, the diffusion of the product within the market first. Uh, second, uh, because it all depends on this, the actual product impact will depend every day. Every time the, the product is, the, the high impact product is, is uh, more used, its actual impact will increase. And finally, uh, depending on the terms used uh, by the products, like the terms of the green bond or the terms of a sustainability link bond, uh, the product can reach its full potential or be much below its full potential. I can give an example like sustainability link bonds. Uh, maybe we can prove, let's say, and I'm telling you that there is no actual evidence proving this, unfortunately, uh, sustainability link bonds, they uh, apply uh, a kind of penalty if at, at a certain observation date, the issuer of the bond has not met a certain target regarding a certain K KPI. And then uh, from that moment on, it will suffer a penalty on its uh, yields, on the coupon he has to pay to the bond holders. So we can maybe it's a way to uh, emulate companies. It's a way to force them to uh, meet their KPIs and to meet bold KPIs. But uh, depending on the, the level of the penalty and the uh, boldness of the target, you may change or not change at all the path of the carbon emissions of the issuer. So it all depends on details. So uh, you have a structure and then you have the specific terms of the products and all of them uh, will have an impact on the, uh, will have an effect, sorry, on the product impact. Uh, then comes the problem of the measurability of impacts. Uh, it, it was briefly said by Rob, like uh, it's so much complex to know what leads to what. Uh, those were the words by uh, Rob uh, and, and it's true. It's so complex to prove causality or to prove additionality. Uh, it's much easier to prove correlation. And instead of additionality, there could be only, as I said before, substitution. So we have to be clever, ideally, to distinguish between causality and correlation and between additionality and substitution. Unfortunately, it's pretty impossible because to do that, we would need, ideally, to run uh, randomized uh, controlled trials. And in the case of financial products, that means that we would, we should forbid some companies to use some uh, specific green financial products. So it's impossible to, uh, to forbid the access to some financial products. So we cannot run the randomized control, uh, control trials. So we, we do not have access to the perfect way to observe and measure impact, unfortunately. So we have to be clever and find a second best option, a second best strategy. And at 2DI, we are in favor of uh, trying to gather evidence at two different levels or of fueling a discussion at two different levels. First level is the discussion of uh, the impact mechanisms. Do the green financial products use, tap or lever the very classic uh, impact mechanism that have been documented by uh, the work by Julian and uh, Eve, uh, Julian Kolbel and Eve, or by the uh, impact management project. 
so there there is a list of of uh, different uh, favorite i would say impact mechanisms so we can relate the structures with those impact mechanisms that's the first stream of research that is needed to uh have a qualitative assessment of the uh, impact of a green financial products or sustainable financial products. Second stream that is also needed is to gather evidence that uh, the investees that use the so-called green financial products, they have better uh, uh, achievements in terms of reduction of their carbon emissions, because at 2DI, we are so much focused on carbon emissions because it is our mission. So uh, we need to use a very indirect strategy made of two steps. First step is to assess the, the different impact mechanisms that are used by the products. And second step, to observe whether the investees are better in terms of reduction of their carbon emissions. So in an ideal world, there would be plenty of research doing those two things. So uh, analyzing the, the use of impact mechanisms and providing uh, evidence for effects on the, at the investee level. We will see that in practice, we do not have so much research on that, unfortunately. So if we, uh, so at 2DI, we are now focused on the first part of the, of the problem which is to assess the, the impact mechanisms that are uh, used by the different product uh, uh, green products. So based on the work uh, from IMP and Julian, uh, we have applied the taxonomy that Julian briefly introduced at the end of his speech uh, to uh, an, an analysis at, at the uh, product level. So uh, what kind of uh, impact mechanisms can be used by the different green financial products. So there is a signaling mechanism, like it helps the investor or the, or the investee to prove its commitment to the green energy transition. That could be uh, an impact mechanism. But we know based on uh, Julian work, for instance, that the signaling, uh, the, inv the evidence that signaling works is pretty, pretty weak, unfortunately. The second uh, impact mechanism that can be used by a financial product is the service of new or undersupplied markets. So markets, let's say issuers, that have a difficult access to funding. Do the new products uh, fill the gap? Do they provide financing to companies that were lacking financing? Third, third mechanism, do they provide flexible capital? To make it simple, do they provide cheaper capital compared to basic financial solutions? Fourth one, do they force or do they pressure the investees to align with a below two degree scenario? Or do they help them to uh, keep on on the same trajectory or to choose a, tra a trajectory that is not aligned with the Paris Agreement? And finally, uh, because we are talking about products and we're talking about um, uh, the contribution to the green energy transition, based on the uh, literature, we have come to a, a, a new criterion that is the transfer of the project risk. Because when you engage into a green project in order to, let's say, to uh, decrease the emissions of your uh, production processes, you may be uh, reluctant to do it because of the, the, the many risks you will not be capable to control because this is not your business. If you are a, a traditional company not working in the green business, using green solution may imply a certain risk for you. So some products help to remove that risk, that very specific project risk and leave it to the investor. So out away from the investees, to the investor. So at the end, we come to a, a list of five different impact mechanisms. Four of them are directly the transposition of the taxonomy uh, uh, pushed by IMP and Julian and, uh, and, and Eve, plus one more criterion that is the transfer of project risk. And in a forthcoming paper, we apply this grid to a list of 10 different green financial products. 
to observe whether they may have a high impact potential based on the impact mechanisms. So I will provide two examples. First one is the most popular structure, which is green bonds. So we ask ourselves whether green bonds provide a clear signal of a commitment to the green energy transition, whether they uh, transfer risk, whether they provide financing to undersupplied markets, whether they provide flexible capital, and whether they force the investees to align. And our conclusion is pretty, pretty negative. Like uh, the commitment is not very uh, clear because you can use, for instance, green bonds for many different environmental purposes. It's not only to mitigate climate change. Second, uh, you do not provide, uh, you do not transfer risk because the, bo the bond is not related to the project it is supposed to finance. The bond is related, is supported by the entire balance sheet of the company. Third, uh, it does not provide financing to companies that were lacking financing because most green bonds are accessible to large companies only because of the additional costs and the resources you have to provide to, uh, to do the uh, specific reporting that is required by green bonds, for instance. It doesn't provide flexible capital in, uh, in a magnitude that would be significant enough to change the path of green investments of investors. So there is a lot of research on the supposed greenium, which is a difference in yield between conventional bonds and green bonds. And very recent evidence proves that there is a greenium, but the greenium is very small. It's like between five basis, basis points to maximum of 20 basis points between a conventional bond and a green bond issued by the same issuer. So it's not enough to uh, change the pathway of investors regarding green investments. Plus, as I said before, there are additional costs if you issue a green bonds. And finally, uh, that do green bonds force investors to align? It all depends on the certification and the, the principles the green bond issuers will follow. Uh, there are the green bond principles that have been uh, issued by uh, the ICMA, which is a, a group, which is, let's say, a, a, a business association by the, the, in, the investment banks, let's say. And those green bond principles do not force the issuer to be aligned, do not force the issuer to adopt green projects that would be aligned with a, a below two degree scenario. But on the other side, there is the certification by the uh, Climate Bonds Initiative that is doing this, that is forcing the issuer to be aligned, to uh, invest in, in uh, technologies that are fully aligned with the uh, Paris Agreement scenario. So uh, it all, in that case, it all depends on the principles the, the green bond issuers do follow. I will also show uh, another example, which are the low carbon uh, mutual funds, equity mutual funds. Uh, in that case, the, the signal of a commitment to the green energy transition is much clearer because you invest in companies that do provide solution to, the, to mitigate climate change. So in terms of signal, it's pretty clear. But do they propose a transfer of the green project risk? No. Again, uh, 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 in that case, sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's an investment in the secondary market. So it's not associated to any specific project. You just purchase a stock from another investor. So it doesn't uh, provide capital to the issuer and it's not associated to a certain uh, project to which you will uh, transfer the risk. So no, definitely not. Uh, does it supply under supply markets? No. Uh, most low carbon funds focus targets large companies that do not have any problem to access financial markets. Do they provide flexible capital? Uh, again, I insist it's secondary markets uh, mostly, so they do not pro provide capital to the issuers, but they provide liquidity and they support 
the valuation of the company. So at some point, it can be translated to higher valuation that could be used by the company to raise capital at, uh, at better conditions. So in that case, it all depends on the strategy of uh, the low carbon mutual funds. Would they continue purchasing stocks if the valuation gets very high? If they do not do that, they do not contribute to decrease the cost of capital of the issuers, not even indirectly. And finally, do they provide any pressure for the investors to align? No, because they are already aligned and there is nothing in the, in the design of the funds that force the, the, the companies in which those funds are invested to align even more. So no. So uh, I'm done with the two uh, examples. In the forthcoming paper, we, we, we would apply the same read to a list of 10, not only two. So uh, within that paper, we also observed whether there is currently research proving the effects of those green financial structures on the investees. Do they accelerate their transition after issuing or, 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 be, or issuing the, the, the green financial products? And to our surprise, the research is very small, very limited regarding that uh, problem. Most of the research, nearly all the research covering those green financial products are interested into the financial effects of these products, the financial effects on the investors, so the returns, or the investors, the cost of capital. But they, most of the research of the research neg neglects the problem of the, of the effects in the real economy. <clears throat> and it's particularly obvious for green bonds. You have dozens of research uh, interested into the greenium problem and pretty nothing on the real effects on the trajectory of carbon emissions of the companies issuing green bonds. Even if green bonds is the, the topic that has been covered by most researchers regarding the effects. So it's the best uh, student in the room, but still there is very, very small research, like five or six pieces of research only. So at 2DI, we advocate for a clear reorientation of the research, not only studying the financial effects, but also the real life effects, especially on carbon emissions, both at the micro level, so the behavior of the issuers, but also at the macro level, the collective emissions of sectors, for instance. So we need a rerouting of the research. So I, I told you that I, uh, we conducted uh, a literature review and we came with a maximum of 10 studies interested in the real life effects of those green financial products. And most of them are interested in green bonds only. We have one on green mutual funds and another one on grid crowdfunding, and that's all to our knowledge. Maybe we, we missed some of them, but uh, probably not so many. So it's very limited so far. So that's uh, our first uh, recommendation that research would be more balanced, not only interested in financial effects, but also on real life effects. Plus we have, by studying the different uh, products, especially the most popular, the most popular ones, we came to the conclusion that we need some uh, transformation of the, of the supply. Uh, we need to open the most popular structures to SMEs and not only to large companies, especially green bonds or sustainability link bonds. Uh, we need solutions that target primary market and not only secondary market because some companies really need financing. So that could take the form of green crowdfunding or uh, energy performance contracts, for instance. Uh, th that would be interesting, not only for, for small companies, but also for households, because most of uh, agreed parts of the investments uh, necessary for the green energy transition at, are at the level of households, and they are lacking financial support. And uh, finally, we, can, we should get use of securitization, even, even if we had a collective bad memory of securitization because of the subprime crisis. It's a very important tool to connect the small scale project holders with the large institutional investors, including the central bank. So uh, we ask for a development of asset backed green bonds, for instance. And the wall of it 
would require a public support through different forms because we need to mitigate the extra cost associated to those products, especially the due diligence cost, especially if you are interested in very small scale projects, the multiplication of the projects imply higher due diligence costs for the funds, for instance. So who would pay for the cost? Would the investor accept to pay for the cost? That's not sure. It all depends on the preferences and we go back to workshop one. And uh, we need to uh, uh, mitigate the reluctance of investors to go to those new structures. So maybe uh, tax incentives would help in that case. So my conclusion about it is that there is still a long way to transform so-called green financial products into uh, devices that provide a clear high level impact. So uh, we need a, a lot of energy to transform this and that's very crucial. Thank you so much for listening to this. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Um, well, there's a few minutes left. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel, feel free to, to post them. Um, I believe all our speakers are still online and will be happy to answer questions. I just want to say something to Julian. Sure. Yes. Uh, I was uh, uh, listening to you, and uh, at some point, I, I, uh, you said something, and I always believed the same way, and now I'm changing my mind. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you said uh, there are different ways to have impact as an investor. One is to grow green companies. The other one is to improve brown ones. But yeah. additionally, it is even more complex. If you grow green companies, it shouldn't be at the expense of at the expense of other green companies. So if you help a green companies to gain market shares, if it's done at the expense of other green companies, you do not have impacts. That's correct. So it's, that's even uh, more complex. Yeah, the additionally, the problem is a, is a killing. Yeah, I, I agree. It is really a tough one. Um, but I also think, you know, for this industry, it's important that somehow incentives are created that are maybe not, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to go in the right direction. Um, uh, so I think there's, you can overdo it with additionality, um, but, but I always say, you know, it's, it's not, you don't have to measure it necessarily because that's hard but you have to have it in there conceptually because if you don't, then you sort of, I think, uh, take a wrong direction. Um, but yeah, uh, you are completely right. If you grow a green company, it has to be green relative to the rest. Um, yeah, otherwise, green, it yeah, doesn't yeah. actually green, improve. Yeah, green greener than the rest. Yes. Okay, I think we, we are getting uh, close to the end of the, the session. Um, perhaps I'll put a, a last question that I have here. It's uh, if there is considerable investor appetite for sustainability, and this is for all speakers, uh, how can we ensure they are directed to products with the most impact possible? Uh, we can only provide uh, qualitative assessment. I think at the end, uh, the measurability is too complex. So qualitative assessment mostly, I guess. I think there is a, an important uh, dimension to add to this discussion. So essentially Julian and, uh, uh, and you sort of had a discussion on more or less opportunity costs. So if you invest in one green topic, then some other at the expense of the other, you, you are not really changing something. But I think the delivery of all of this, we are talking about financial products and that's that's it. We're not really doing something science-based or whatever. It's, it's financial products. I don't believe in a financial market structure in which the wrong incentives for all these financial market institutions are pointing in the wrong directions. Short-termism, bonuses, still there. Uh, coming back after 2008. So I, the scalability of the ideas of green financial products for the real, uh, real retail sector, I think is really small. So you can only really have impact in my view if you also scale it up. And one way to do that is to 
integrate their green financial products into, for instance, pension funds contacts or other scalable contacts, because the people that like the green financial products, even though they might be like five or 10% or whatever, are also all pension retirees or pension beneficiaries, and they have products at insurance companies. I think to, to really let this go or deploy every, every potential of this, I think we need to bring this together and not just hope that the banks will develop products that, uh, that will be bought by other people. Because I don't think that will happen as easily. I think man, this is a great closer question and I, I like that's a really good point, Rob, and, and reflected in what you do, I might say, but uh, I agree. Um, for the other, so something that is interesting, of course, in just in recent days are these investigations uh, and that somehow the, the claims that you make about ESG and, and impact are, you know, there's now all of a sudden law enforcement in the room and maybe you can't actually just say what you please. Um, this is super interesting. Uh, and I think um, good regulation in, in sort of regulating these claims will also, you know, be an important piece, you know, to the question, how do people who have the ambition to do something, you know, to lead them to the products that do that. Um, I think that will be really important. Thank you very much, um, everyone, to all the speakers. Thank you, Hank Holt. Thank you, Julian Felber. Thank you, Michael Mongo. And Thank you, Rob Bauer. Um, I, we have reached the end of this, uh, these two workshops. Um, I, I thank everybody for great presentations, and I hope everybody uh, got the information they, they wanted to, to get from these sessions. Thanks, Arno. Thanks all. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Let's okay. meet at the Beijing Central train station for a drink afterwards, okay? <laughs> yeah. I'm on my way. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm on my way too, yes. <laughs> good to see you okay. all, and thank you. Thank bye -bye. you very much. Bye-bye.